Got absent-minded professor, there we go. There we are, there we are. <laughs> so, but thank you for putting up with my ways. I, I was even provided with a cup of tea. Wow, that was just wonderful. And by a British patriot at that, you know, you know from Jamaica. So, just wonderful. And so, I really felt at home straight away. You know how to make an Englishman feel at home. So you've obviously, well, somehow got things really good in the way you've uh, got people uh, really looking after people. But seriously, I'm very impressed with, uh, with some of the people. I won't name names, but you know, I, I, as soon as I came here, somebody was sharing their testimony with me. And I thought it was wonderful to hear how through this church, people have been reached from all sorts of walks of life. And I'm just so pleased to see God's work just reaching out and the emphasis on evangelism, which is so important. And what I'm saying tonight is actually not disconnected with the whole theme of reaching out with the message of Christ. But you know full well that so many people just don't want to know about these issues, particularly in academia. And the reason is, they say, well, you know, God didn't make the world. What about the dinosaurs and all the other stuff they come out with? Um, friends, I want you to see the marvel of the science which points like a massive signpost to the truth of creation. I was debating last night Dan Barker in uh, San Diego State University. We had a good crowd out. But frankly, as I was debating, I expected Dan Barker to come out with, you know, good, solid science, you know, at least science-based arguments. I, I knew I wasn't going to agree with him. But what came out was a tirade against the Bible. And an angry person speaking against God and calling him all sorts of names. He had been a pastor for 19 years. If you read Dan Barker's story, you can find it out on Google. It's, it's very, very sad, friends, because people are deluded. They really think that there is no such thing as creation. So frankly, if I'm going to reach people who've been influenced by Dawkins, Barker, sadly, Christopher Hitchens has died now, but people like that, how are we going to reach them if we don't, first of all, dismantle and cast away their, the imaginary ideas that they've got in their mind? The scripture speaks of dismantling these things which are in their minds. We've got to do that, friends. Now, I know that an argument is not going to win a person to Christ. It's going to be God's Holy Spirit which does it. But we need to be those who are prepared to give an answer for the hope that is within us, even in this area of creation. And I'm just going to simply talk to you about flight. I'm going to ask to you the question, did, did these things just come by evolutionary magic, or was it brilliant engineering? How did these, uh, these wonderful machines that we see in, in the sky, how did they come about? Was it through some sort of magic evolutionary idea, or was there distinct creation? I had the privilege two years ago of seeing the blue angels at Miramar, and the wow factor comes out in these videos. Let me just play them to you. I think you'll enjoy them. Absolutely stunning, we've all seen it, and the red arrows, well, we do fairly well, uh, but that was not the red arrows, that was the blue angels, which I, stunning, but it all began with these two guys. And it was just a hundred and, whatever it is, 113 years ago, or thereabouts, uh, 112 years ago before. And of course, this was the two gentlemen who were simply bicycle makers. I love to say that, friends. 
Flight started, not with the Smithsonian getting it right. Oh, no, no. The Smithsonian tried all sorts of things which ended up with people in the bottom of the Potomac River, if you know the story. But these two guys were the ones who got it right. And do you know how they did it? There they are in their bowler hats going to work. It was quite funny the way they, they worked in those days. But they did it by hard work copying birds. They realized that nature had brilliant designs. And although they weren't looking, and I will in a moment look at a feather, but they looked at these feathered creatures and they saw the way the wings were constructed and they realized that the only way we're going to get this right is to copy what the birds do. They even had a wind tunnel. Do you realize it? They were the first ones, just bicycle makers, to work out that they've got to pass air over a model. The Smithsonian hadn't even caught up with that idea, right? I love to say this because it's a real story which has an irony in it. Because where is the right flyer today? The right flyer is a sort of a reconstruction, but it's a pretty good model of it. The right flyer sits in the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. And of course, it's their pride and joy. But did they support these two men to begin with? Oh, no, no, no. If you read the story, you'll find that no, they, they didn't. They didn't at all. But of course, you know that this was all done in 1903 on a cold winter's day, December the 17th, 1903. And what these men did was to understand the principle of what was going on in creation. It's an example of what we call biomimetics, where you copy nature with a view to using it in engineering. Now, in order to understand flight, we need to understand it's not just a matter of jumping from a tower with wings on. They understood that. In fact, this chap probably didn't actually survive to tell the tale, to be frank. But it's not just a matter of growing feathers. These guys, well, they did it sort of, but it wasn't heavier than air flight. You might say they were sort of cheating. But uh, OK, it worked, but it's not what we're talking about. We're talking about heavier than air flight, and of course, it's all to do with wings. Now, where do you put all the feathers? Well, that's one thing you've got to realize to begin with. Let's talk about feathers. It's a matter of not just putting them anywhere. You've got to have flight feathers on the outside. You've got to have secondary feathers here, tertiary feathers. And it gets complicated if I go through all those details. There's covering feathers as well. Look, what I would just want to get over to you is that flight is not simple. Right? It's not just a matter of having any old feathers anywhere. If you get a flight feather like this flight feather from a buzzard, this is heavily curved. And you'll see that it's not the same on one side than the other. That's how you tell that it's a flight feather. If you're going to train your, you don't call them budgery guards. You've got a funny, you keep on mussing about with the language. But in England, we call them budrigars, these small little birds, right? If you want to train them to do what they're told, you call them anything that sort of tweets, you call a parrot. But anyway, that's another matter. But uh, yeah, it is in the parrot family. But anyway, if you're going to train that bird to do what you want it to do, you cut off the flight feathers. It's not being cruel because they'll grow again. This bird can't fly, but it does what it's told and comes to you and you give it some food and you train it. And that's the way they work. So these flight feathers are utterly vital to make a bird fly. But it's not the only feathers, as I mentioned. There's all these other feathers as well. There's tail feathers, which have got to be in the right place. Now, look, don't bother too much about all the sophisticated words like that word there. I'm not even going to explain it. But you know what? what when you get a, a wing in a wind tunnel, which is what the Wright brothers did, Wilbur and Orville, they actually realized that you've got to make the right shape. And this is the amazing thing, that not only have feathers got to be in the right place looking down on the wing, the feathers got to be in the right place to build the wing. I find that amazing, just that mere fact that a wing is a sophisticated system of, made from feathers, right? And here's a picture I took with my 500 millimeter lens in Scotland. In fact, it was the same time that I met Pastor Brodson, or just before it, we'd been in the Isle of Mull and we were coming back through Glasgow, or we decided to come back through Glasgow and, and we 
uh, we did the Creation Fest there. But on the Isle of Mull, this is the picture I took of a, of a white-tailed eagle. And look, apart from the wonderful face there, but look at the wings and look at this heavily curved wing on the upper surface, all made from feathers. And we'll come in a moment to these things as well. This is another picture of it in a, a high G turn. Now, where did this all come from? Are we really saying that feathers just evolved from scales? Because that's what evolution teaches us, that some creature like that, obviously not exactly like that, but here's a reptile, here's a lizard. Are we really saying that that's what happened? Because people are seriously proposing that in the books. They're saying this is a... Japanese gentleman who's trying to tell us that a feather has the same structure as a scale. To be frank, this question, true or false, only has one answer, and that is no way. Even though he says that he thinks that that's the case. A scale is growing from a completely different position in the skin to a feather. Yes, they're made of the same material, but that's where the similarity ends. The fact that you've got a car made of, you say aluminum, let me teach you properly what the proper word is, aluminium, right? The fact that, <laughs> I thought you'd like that one. The fact that a car might be made of the same material doesn't mean that a car's evolved into an aeroplane. We know full well that they're just totally different designs, but using the same material. I won't bore you with all the, you know, all the detail here, but just get the basic idea that a feather doesn't come just on its own. It comes with a little tube. And the little tube is where the feather grows. So it grows up in this little tube and is eventually placed exactly in the right place on the wing. And the reason they grow in tubes is actually obvious when you see a bird molting. Because when a bird molts, you've got all the feathers growing together. So what happens is that they all grow in their little tubes, right? And they're all placed exactly in the right place such they don't interfere with each other as they're pushing up and growing. That's clever, wouldn't you agree? See, there's, there's cleverness all the way down. Is this brilliant engineering or is it evolutionary magic? It's obviously brilliant engineering. And yet the Dan Barkers of this world and other people who are trumpeting these horrible statements about God being a, a, you know, a monster, and that, you know, this, this idea of a God who's created the world is total fabrication. They are going in the full face, not just of what the Bible says, but in terms of what the evidence is saying. And I want you to see, friends, that you don't need to have a PhD in aeronautics necessarily. I mean, obviously, I'm I'm trained in this area, but you just take something that you delight in, in the created world, and just say to the person next to you on the plane, where did that come from, right? I sometimes do that. I don't get lots of opportunities, but now and again, I get an opportunity to say to the person next to me, you know, what do you think about creation? Or I say what I'm, what I'm doing, what I'm flying to, and I say, what are you going to do there? Well, I'm going to speak on creation against evolution. What? You know, and then that starts a conversation. And sometimes it gets there. But, you know, you don't need to necessarily talk about all these uh, sophisticated details, but you just choose something which really interests you. So the follicle is where the feather actually starts growing. It actually grows from a tiny little uh, bit at the bottom here, which is alive, connected to the rest of the body. And the feather grows in this tube. So it's a bit like this. You see the feather. This is obviously speeded up but it just gives you the idea as to what's going on. And then the keratin little tube here, like this big pen, which has sort of just been dismantled, that just crumbles away. And it's really just, it's just so obvious that this is not the same as the scale, which that Japanese professor was trying to tell me it evolved from. But now let me tell you something just utterly wonderful about feathers. I sometimes ask a young, well, maybe this young lady would like to come up. Would you like to just come up and uh, do this with me? Come on, come up. That's right. I don't bite, right? And uh, 
particularly as it's Wednesday, I won't bite, so thank you. Now, what I want you to do is to come over here so you can actually be seated. So what I'm going to do, so, so you can see that it's not me doing magic, right? That's why I've got somebody up here who doesn't have a clue what's going on, right? So if I, well, I'm sure you have some of a clue. What's your name, by the way? Maria. Nice to meet you, Maria. Right. Now, look, I'm Andy, by the way. And look, Maria, I'm going to separate the feather, right? Right, that's dead easy. But what is just a little bit harder, but doesn't take too much work, is to actually make it go back together again. Okay. Now, you might think, I'm just doing magic. I'm going to get Maria to do it. You do it, Maria. No, do it up here so that the camera can see it, right? So they, they can see on wherever they're looking at this program, and they can see what's going on. Yeah, you can do it there. That's fine. Now, now try and do what I did before. I'm sure you can do it, right? You just run your finger and thumb over it. You, you, you can go a bit more strongly than that. It won't break. Well, not unless you crumple it. Yeah, there you are. You've done it. So, Maria, you're clever. Well, it's not you that's clever, is it? It's something going on in the feather. Yeah. So give her a clap. <laughs> See? Now, that's great. Thank you, Maria. So, look, I love to say that all you need is a feather to knock over the juggernaut of evolution. Because in a feather, there is brilliant lightweight engineering. Do you know what's going on? It's, the clue is on this screen. This is the barb that she separated from another barb, right? But little did Maria know, and I didn't know this until I was taught it, of course, is that in between the barbs, there is a clever lattice of overlapping, I'm going to use a complicated word, but I think you'll manage it, particularly with, well, we won't go into accents and all the rest of it, but just follow, can you follow my words? Or you got lost already? You're following me. OK, you really are. OK, so it's got barbules. That means a little barb, right? And it's got barbules going one way, which have hooks on, and barbules going the other way, which have ridges on. So the hooks, like curtain rails on the curtain, curtain hooks on the curtain rail, are sliding over one another. You get the idea? Is, is that complicated? Well. In one sense, it is, because you're not expecting it on a feather. But it's clever and yet sort of simple as well when you see what's going on. Because it means that a feather is a lightweight surface which is bendable but beats against the air and feels the air pressure and all the rest of it. And did you know that a bird can twist every single feather and it can manipulate them? But it also means that a feather hangs together by this clever system, a lattice structure of barbules. So there's a picture of it, so you get the idea. You've got the hooks sliding that way. So this is a barbule, right? So the barbs are there, and there's a big barb over here, right, which has got ridges coming out this way, and this adjacent barb has got hooks coming that way. So the hooks slide over the ridges. It's a bit like Velcro, right? Velcro, of course, doesn't have the ridges, but it does have hooks on one side, and of course, in this case, all the hooks are in the same direction, and all the ridges are in another direction. So you get a sliding mechanism. Come on, say together with me, wow. wow. Now you got it, right? So this is brilliant engineering. And who's the engineer? It's got to be God, isn't it? Now, is that an argument which the, the, those who accuse me of this, it, they say it was a god of the gaps. Now, is that, when you think about it, an argument from god of the gaps? No, it's not, is it? Do you see what I'm saying? Evolution tries to, evolutionists try to say, oh, because you don't know what's going on, you say that God did it. But that's precisely the opposite of what I'm doing. Do you see why? Because I'm telling you, not that it's that sophisticated, but I'm telling you that the more you go down looking at the engineering of what's going on, every single thing that you find is saying what? That there is a design involved, and it's pointing to a designer. So it's the complete opposite of God of the gaps thinking. 
So whenever somebody says to you, are you just believing God of the guts because you don't understand aeronautics, or you don't understand some area of genetics, which I'm not going to deal with tonight, or some other area in the created world, you just say to them, just a minute, I'm going to swat up on this particular area, and look at, look at this, look at that, look at the other. They're all little signposts telling you that every single bit of engineering, right down to the molecular scale, is pointing to a brilliant engineer. Now look, if you've got a slight, oh, you've got to clap, of course you should. <laughs> Absolutely, I agree. But please don't praise me, it's, I've, I'm, I trust you're doing this to the glory of the Creator. And of course, John chapter 1, John chapter 1, verse 3 says, that without him was not anything made that was made. And who's the him? It tells you in John chapter 1 that it's the Word of God, which is the Word made flesh, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. So really, the whole creation gives glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the greatest glory of all to Christ is what he did on the cross. But, you know, both creation and redemption give glory to Christ. Now, look, if you've got a sliding joint, what do you need? Now, in the past, I might have said, you know, all you engineers, and I'd be thinking of the fellows, but you've got to be careful about that these days. So, you know, I've got to say the women and the men, and there's some very brilliant women as well, but I don't usually think of the ladies as sort of getting involved with a lot of this stuff. But uh, maybe they do. So, if you're a woman engineer here, I must respect the fact that male and female, whatever you do, are, you need oil for a sliding joint. Now, do you see that? I didn't want to think of you in overhauls getting all muddy and, you know, getting all stuck with oil. But look, oil, where does it come from on a bird? Where does the oil come from a bird? Let me show you. It comes from the base of the spine of the bird. So the bird has to have the ability to turn its head 180 degrees. Can you do that tonight? Can, can you do that with me? Turn your head 180 degrees and get your nose, the equivalent of a beat down on the spine. You won't be able to do it, will you? You see, a bird's got to have that ability to do it. And feathers, by the way, have always been feathers. Now, please don't think that I accept the dates on here. I don't. That's another... Another thing which uh, I won't be able to deal with tonight, and I'm just on this issue of flying and how it works. But look, this is supposedly millions of years old, and it's a feather which is from Archaeopteryx, which is supposed to be a halfway creature. Actually, it's nothing like a halfway creature. It was just an extinct bird. But what I want you to see, that it's no different to a feather we have today. Here's a feather which is locked in amber, which is hardened resin, which has come from a tree. Actually, I think all these things probably came from the flood, but that, that's another matter. But the point I'm making is that even if you were to say this was millions of years, the feather is no different to a feather that we have today. And it's heavily curved. And so what this is showing is that feathers have always been what? feathers. And that is the issue. They are brilliant bits of engineering. Look, friends, I want to just hurry on because I want to just show you some other wonderful things. I will just mention that Richard Dawkins on one occasion um, mentioned this. He, he said when asked what uh, um, actually caused a feather to come into being, he said on this program on that wonderful neutral um, organization called the BBC in England, which ran this program, A Brief History of Disbelief, shows you how neutral they are. Um, uh, you can laugh, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Jonathan Miller was uh, running this program, and he asked this Richard Dawkins, uh, so where did the feather come from? And he asked in a very pointed way. He said, oh, I suppose it's a matter of faith on my part. In other words, Richard Dawkins didn't have a clue where a feather came from. And he tried to say, oh, well, it was a matter of faith because it's such a well-established theory. And if you can't actually work out how it came about, well, that's your problem, not mine. Well, it basically, that's what he said. So if you look this up, you're, you can uh, hear him say that. I won't play it now. But, you know, Dawkins not only didn't understand where a feather came from, 
and was trying to argue, obviously, for its evolution without any evidence. But he's also redefining faith, because in his mind, faith is blind. And when you don't understand something, you say you have faith. And he accuses us of defining faith that way. But of course, our faith is not blind. It's not that we understand everything. Who does? But that which we do understand, we say, gives credibility to the statement, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That which we do understand, as I've been saying, points towards God who has made it. Now look, let me tell you something else about flight. You need control. Now look, I could go into all the detail about the ailerons and the flaps, and that would bore you stiff, most of you. But you get the basic idea, don't you, that you mustn't just have one wing. You can't just have one wing on one side. Most of us realize that airplanes have two wings. Next time you look at a plane, just, just see it's got two wings. And you might also realize that it's got a tail. Interestingly, the Wright brothers put their tail at the front, which was an interesting concept. It, it worked, you know, but you had to balance it technical term is longitudinally as well as laterally, but we'll forget those complicated words. As you look forward, they had to balance the aeroplane that way, but you also have to balance it this way, and it's quite complicated. You try and get onto a flight simulator to fly an aircraft, and it's not easy. Um, there, and when it comes to flying helicopters, as the, our British royal family, one of them is uh, William, you know, is a trained um, he's the crown prince, and he's a trained helicopter pilot, and that is hugely difficult. Flight is not simple because you need control surfaces. Now, it's no good just having all the bits. You've got to have a means of putting all the bits together. You cannot just put the bits in bit by bit. You've got to actually put two wings together because one wing's no use. You've got to put a tailplane as well. You've got to have a fin as well and all the rest of it, as you can see. We call this principle, get this, guys, please get this. We call this irreducible complexity. Have you got that term? You, uh, seriously, I do want you to remember this one. Irreducible, break it up into what it means. It means that you cannot reduce it, right? In other words, you cannot take this complex system and reduce it to one bit at a time and gradually, I'll use the word, evolve it. You can't do it. Because in order to make flights, you cannot have half a wing. You cannot have just one wing. You've got to have another wing. You've got to have the tail for all the th reasons I've just mentioned. You see? So it's irreducible complexity. So when we say to the evolutionist, it's complex, that's not quite enough, because they'll immediately come back to us and say, well, give me a million universes and we'll evolve it. Actually, time or number of universes is not the issue. You will never evolve this, because it's a system that you need in order to make it work. Now, all engineers know about this in Airbus or in Boeing, or whoever, you know, you're talking about Bombardier in Canada. They all know that in order to build a plane, you haven't just got to get one bit right, you've got to get all bits right together. When I tried to put that point to Dan Barker last night, he just didn't grasp it, basically. He didn't grasp it. And I don't think half of the evolutionists grasp this point. Flight needs control and the Wright brothers understood it. Well, just briefly to show you some of the control surfaces, not that I'm going to talk about them in detail, that's a, a Lockheed TriStar from years ago, but you can actually see the flaps coming down, which is a very mechanical system. And you can see here, there's another aircraft which has forward flaps as well. But now you come to a bird and you see, wow, there's no comparison with the agility of the wing of a bird. It can change that surface in a moment. Whereas if you're on a big Airbus A320 or whatever it is, Boeing 777 coming into Los Angeles Airport, you'll see it take, it has to come round hundreds, well, not quite hundreds of miles, but certainly 50 or 60 miles in to come in on the approach, and then it gradually slows the speed down, and then there's a particular time when it puts the flaps down. Boy, it's complicated to land one of those things. 
And even if you're in a Cessna, you know, a tiny little thing, and by the way, don't get too close to an Airbus, or otherwise you get flipped over. But you know, if you're in one of these Cessnas, it's still complicated to get things right. But a bird does it with ease, because it can change the position of its wing without any real necessity of sort of changing the, the speed and all the rest of it. It can do it in a moment without any problem. In Scotland, there's also wonderful seabirds. Not only eagles, but these are gannets. Gannets are marvelous birds. They're like mini albatrosses, you know, the albatross which can fly for thousands of miles just on one journey and then come back again. They're not quite as good as that in terms of long distance, but they're very good flyers. Now look at this picture that a friend of mine took of, an, of a gannet changing its wings, right, until it comes down like a pencil into the water to grab a fish. That shows the agility, in this case, of seabirds. Here's another example, same bird as it twists over and does this dramatic maneuver. And of course, I showed you earlier the eagle, which is mentioned, by the way, in Proverbs chapter 30, the, the wonder of the flight of an eagle. There are just magnificence, there is rather magnificence in these birds. Now, birds have control surfaces. Did you see that I pointed out earlier these? I'll just briefly mention those. Because only in the last about 20 years, aircraft have started putting winglets on the end of the wings. Have you ever wondered why the what the reason is? I won't go into too much detail, but just let me just get this point over. That the Airbus and the Boeing people watched the birds and they realized that, there was, that these birds had winglets, as you can see here. This is a bald eagle with its wing curved up. The reason why? It actually reduces the amount of energy loss at low speed. It's a bit more detailed than that so to do with what we call induced drag. But don't worry too much about all these complicated terms. What I want you to see is that here's an Airbus, which has also got a winglet, almost identical in the shape of what the eagles had ever since creation. Which came first? Well, obviously, the eagle did. Who's the brilliant engineer then? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't this really another wow factor? Thank you. You see, we need to realize that the glory is to God who made these things, not to some evolutionary process. All the evidence shows that birds always were birds. Archaeopteryx, it was just simply an extinct bird. It's a pity we don't have it anymore, but we haven't got them anymore. Let me now talk to you about something I think you will identify with, and that is hovering. We're coming to the star player. You know what's coming in a moment. But just let me talk briefly about the kestrel. The kestrel is a bird which hovers by flicking its wings like this. Right? It's, it's doing this all the time. And you've got an American kestrel here, which is very colorful. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that the European bird is not as colorful, so you've got it better. But let me just show you that the European one is doing it here, and you can see it's, got, it's flicking its wings so fast that it's blurred on the screen. So these are marvelous features because if you notice, this kestrel has got its brake feathers out, its tail feathers, and it's actually balancing against its tail because otherwise it would be flipped right over. But a kestrel, even in a high wind, can stay absolutely stationary. You, next time you have a high wind, you need a, near a, often near freeways um, that you'll see kestrels, we call them motorways, I don't know that yours are always free, but you call them freeways. And uh, the kestrel is there, <laughs> stationary, in, even in a high wind, looking for a vole to dive onto or whatever. But the one that takes the biscuit, or you'd say the cookie, is the hummingbird. Now, hummingbirds are just utterly glorious. To see these birds with their tiny wings, and sometimes they're as small as just a few inches. The bee hummingbird is the smallest bird of all. And by the way, my, my book that I wrote with Stuart Burgess 
is at the back. I forget now what we're selling that for. I think we said $25. Um, but it's got a whole section on flight, which I've done. Stuart Burgess has done uh, many other features as well. And we've shared this book together, and it's just come out. Creation, <coughs> it's called Design in a Fallen World. So I think you might enjoy that, some of you. If you want to look at the hummingbird, there's quite a lot on it in there. <coughs> but the, the hummingbird, as you can see, feeds on nectar from plants. And of course, that raises lots of issues because it's got to have this ability to hover, plus the long beak, plus the tongue, which I'll show you in a moment. All these things have got to be right for a hummingbird, on top of all the other issues that I've already said about feathers. If you look at a tiny hummingbird feather, it's much smaller than this, of course, but it also has tiny little barbules, like I've just been saying. Everything is there in miniature in a hummingbird. <coughs> How does a hummingbird hover? It hovers by this principle. It's actually twisting its wings like this. Everything is operating from this elbow joint. It's not really to do with the shoulder. It, has a, it does have, obviously, the, the humerus bone here, but it's a bit shorter. Everything's more in a bird to do with the radius and the ulna here coming from the elbow, and then an extended hand supporting <coughs> the wing. But with the hummingbird, this is basically rigid at the wrist, and this is, it's doing this all the time, right? But it's doing it in this motion. It's twisting its wing, which means it's got to have a, a, sw a specialized swivel joint here at the elbow. So it can turn and twist its wing something like 270 degrees. It's, it's way over beyond 180. So it's able to do this twisting motion which means that even on what you would normally think is the upstroke, it's doing a downstroke with that as well. And it's doing this at, get this, you might even like to think of this as a wow factor, not 10, not 20, but 50 times per second. And it can even go up to 100 times per second. The other wing, of course, is doing it as well. You might like to try doing this, and you'll soon find that you're running out of energy, right? But now, as well as doing all that, the hummingbird has got to get its food. Where did this, does it get its food from? Well, I just already said to you that it gets it by basically drinking Coke, but I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. It's not really Coke, but it's a bit like it. Um, you'll see here the twisting motion of the wings, right? So if the wings are just beating their wings slightly differently on one side to the other, then it goes sideways. And if that beating motion, I'll come to the feeding in a moment, I said I would, but if that wing motion is actually altered slightly, then it goes up. If it's altered right backwards, then it starts going backwards. But it happens so fast that your eye doesn't realize what's going on. And all you see is <laughs> you just, you're just bemused by it. The whole thing is a wonderful demonstration not of blue angels, because it's not quite as fast, but it's certainly a demonstration of wonderful aerodynamics. What I want to show you, friends, is that this means that it's got to feed. How does a hummingbird feed? Well, let's just watch this little video clip, which will show you uh, a video of the hummingbird. As you can see, slightly slowed down. And you'll see that, <coughs> yes, sorry, it was just doing its doings. but. Uh, uh, you'll see that the hummingbird now, with its very sharp beak, is going to come, and you'll see in a moment, as it brings out its tongue, as many of you have seen hummingbirds do just this, but please watch also not only the wing movement, but the tail movement. So it's balancing itself, really, without thought. It's doing it instinctively, and it's going to eventually come to the feeder and put its tongue out. Now, as its tongue comes out, here he is, he's coming in, and he's going to get his, not his Coke, I'm not really quite right there, but it's basically sugar water, it's nectar, right? And that's really what you do when you're drinking Coke. So this, this hummingbird has to take its own body weight every day in order to survive. Can you imagine eating your body weight every day? You'd have to run around the globe each day, wouldn't you, in order to get the weight off? But the, 
The hummingbird does this. It eats its own body weight every day. That means that at night, it's going to have to be careful not to overuse all that energy. So did you know this, that a hummingbird at night actually turns everything off? Here's the picture of the tongue. Here's the tongue coming out. It's not being rude. It's actually, it's actually getting that tongue into the plant and it pours the nectar down its throat. So it's actually beating its wings 50 to 60 times per second, but the tongue is coming out at 5 to 10 times per second. Would you like to try and do that and put your tongue... Oh, I can't do it. That's what the hummingbird is doing. Now, coming back to this weight issue, as I said to you, at night time, it mustn't misuse all that energy. So God has given it a special technique, which is basically hibernation every night, and it's called torpor. It actually switches down its heartbeat right down to you know very, very slow heartbeat. And the blood is not flowing half as fast as it was before. The temperature's going down. And it's controlling everything, such that you might think that the bird was dead. In fact, if you pick up a bird which is roosting at night, hummingbird maybe has fallen out of its nest, you might think that it's dead, but it's not. A half an hour before sunrise, there's a little kick and says, wake up. And this little clock, which the hummingbird has got, says, I need to start getting my heart going. I need to start getting the blood flowing again. And it takes, you know, about 20 minutes for this to happen. And when the sun comes over the horizon, bang, it's away to collect its own body weight that day again. Isn't that a marvel? Hasn't, hasn't God made everything wonderful to demonstrate his glory even in a fallen world? Now, look, if evolution was true, just, look, there's many things which have to be right, but let's just take three things, beak, tongue, and the ability to hover. Supposing the bird had the ability to hover but didn't have the long beak, well, it wouldn't be able to get its food, so that would be the end of that evolutionary experiment. Supposing, no, remember there's no mind in evolution, we can't keep the ability to hover. So, so supposing another creature, you know, some precursor, has got the long beak, it's got the sharp tongue, but it hasn't got the ability to hover. There are some birds like that called sunbirds in Africa. But then it would come from one side of the plant and go straight through the other, right? It wouldn't be able to stop. So you see, the hummingbird has got to have all these features right. Did you know, generally, birds have bones which are hollow. So bones and muscles are very important in birds. Let me just show you a bit more. You see, we and uh, reptiles generally have solid bones, right? But bird bones, except for diving birds, there are some birds which have solid bones because they're going underwater to get their, their fish or whatever. Gannets wouldn't be the case, but there are some other birds divers birds which would have solid bones. But generally, birds have light structured bones. That's obvious, obviously needed because you're dealing with flight. But may I just tell you one thing though about the muscles of a bird. A bird has a big breastbone, right? Like this. Attached to that breastbone is um, two sets of muscles. And again, I don't want to bore you with all the detail. Just get this basic point that a bird has an extra muscle to reptiles, which it's supposed to have evolved from. And we've also got this muscle, not only reptiles, but we've got this pectoralis major muscle, which you might have used, used to punch your... Well, I'm sure you didn't do that. But, you know, maybe you used it, though, in your four stroke in tennis, or maybe you use it a lot in swimming or whatever it is you do. But now, if you're trying to do a backstroke in tennis, that motion, or if you're trying to do backstroke in swimming, it's more difficult. Because although we have this muscle at the back, it's not very strong. But a bird has another muscle which is threaded round the equivalent of its shoulder. It's called a coracoid, but don't worry about that. It's threaded round, and it comes to the front of this breastbone. 
to the same point. And this muscle, when that contracts, all muscles operate by contraction, when it contracts, it yanks the humerus bone, which is this one, out. You might like to try and do that now. Oh, no, perhaps you'll start clouting your next door neighbor. But it's that motion, right? You try doing that motion repeatedly. You'll find that it's quite tiring, OK? That motion is a little bit easier, but not so with a bird. It's the same for both of them, because it's got these two special muscles. And they operate in a tandem like this. So this is a little film which shows you it. Here's the bird pulling the wing down. Here's the supracoracoid, the other muscle, pulling it up. So these two muscles are operating in tandem. This is, again, brilliant design, because where's most of the weight? Most of the weight is this bit. I can't copy being a bird, but you'll just have to bear with me. It's this motion, right? So my breastbone, if that was the bird, is down here. So this is the weight underneath, which is just right for stability. So everything is right for bird flight, such that you haven't got too much weight above. You've got most weight underneath. And these two muscles are operating in tandem. If you thought that was brilliant, let me mention to you breathing. I hope you're breathing tonight. And if you're going to sleep, wake up. Right? Because you're breathing using two lungs. The air is coming to a dead stop. Then it's passed on into the blood, and the blood passes the carbon dioxide to be breathed out. You know that's what goes on, but not so with a bird. A bird still operates with oxygen and carbon dioxide, but the air comes in through a tube, splits into parallel tubes, and then goes out, and the air doesn't stop. Unlike in our lungs and in reptile lungs, the air keeps going, doesn't stop, and the air gives off the oxygen, which comes into the blood, going in the other direction. And then the air comes out. And of course, the blood flow gives carbon dioxide. So it's the same principle, but it's a continuous flow long. So by the way, if you're trying to get your pet, butter, or your pet parrot and you, it's dying and you want to sort of give it the kiss of life, don't try it. Because it, the lungs don't operate the same way. And if you do this to a bird, you'll just kill it a bit more quickly. So please don't try that, all right? Birds have a different lung system. And unlike us, which breathe through two lungs like that, and the air comes to a dead stop, this is what actually happens with a bird. A bird breathes in, right? Breathes in through the same trachea that we've got. The air comes in, but it doesn't immediately go to the lung. It goes to the back, to an air sac. Then the bird breathes out again. An earlier packet of air comes out, and this packet of air that we're following goes through the lung. Then it breathes in again, and another packet of air goes to the back, and this packet of air goes to the front air sac. Then it breathes out again, and this packet of air comes out. So it's a continuous flow breathing system. Just mention it once more, in case you haven't got it. The air comes in to the back air sac, breathes out. An earlier packet of air goes out, and this packet of air goes through the lung. Then it breathes in again. This packet of air goes to the front air sac. Another packet of air goes there. And this, then it breathes out, and out it comes. It's a two-stroke breathing system. All together, say, wow. This is a very clever system, because you get much more oxygen exchange, much more rapidly with the blood. That's why it needs it. But did you know that a bird doesn't have a diaphragm? And yet, reptiles all have diaphragms. So what are you going to do in between when a reptile hasn't, um, is trying to evolve into a bird? Um, you've got a creature which can't breathe, which means that it would be dead. Can evolution operate on a dead creature? No. You're going to have real problems, guys. Do you know how a bird actually operates its breathing system? Instead of having a... Uh, uh, a diaphragm, it pushes out its breastbone. And the breastbone is a movable breastbone. Ours is slightly movable, but not much. And in order to accommodate that, it's got hinged ribs. It's actually got ribs which have got hinges on it in order to accommodate this moving breastbone. Here, guys, everything is telling you 
birds are wonderfully designed. Well, migration. Do you know why birds fly south in winter? Do you know what the answer is? Because it's too far to walk. <laughs> but what's on the screen is Arctic terns. You know what Arctic terns do? They fly from the North Pole to the South Pole. When it's all dark in the north, they go to the where it's all light in the south. Then six months later, they do the reverse trip. The only thing that stops these small birds from migrating is birds of prey waiting for them in the Mediterranean. Usually in one lifetime, these birds will have flown something like the distance to the moon and back in the 30 years or so that they live. But look, let me tell you about this one because it's relevant to your area. West of here, you've got the islands of Hawaii, about 3,000 miles away or thereabouts. Did you know that the Pacific Golden Plover makes a journey of 3,000 miles without stopping? Now, just think of this for a moment. You've got to actually make sure you've got enough fuel. Those of you who are pilots know about this, that if you take on too much fuel, you've got to be careful. You've got to have the weight right for the distance you're covering. So this is equivalent for a bird with eating, right? So it's got to make sure that it eats enough for the journey, but doesn't eat too much, because either way, it will go plop into the Pacific. But here comes the real issue. Mum and dad go first, and they leave the chicks which have just hatched to make the journey on their own. They've never been to Hawaii before. How do they know where Hawaii is, number one? Possibly due to a, a magnetic map that they might be able to sense. We're not sure yet, but it's becoming, beginning to unfold what's going on. But the marvel is not what we don't know. The marvel is what we do know points to sophisticated design. Somehow there is a genetic sense that they need to go westwards to Hawaii, not, uh, never having been there before. Then you've got the issue that they mustn't eat too much because you could do it with me, Eww, they go into the Pacific. If you eat too little, they get tired and they also go into the Pacific. So these little birds, the chicks which have never been before, have got to get it right. I think you should say with me, <laughs> this gives glory to the one who has made them. It says in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 20, the invisible things of God are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. You know, the bird that takes the real cookie on this, I'll say it properly for you this time, is the bar-tailed godwit. It makes the longest trip ever known. From Alaska to New Zealand, non-stop, six days and six nights on the wing. And again, it has to make sure that it eats enough and yet not too much in order to make the journey. We mentioned the Blue Angels right at the beginning. Let me just show you one last wow factor. The Blue Angels are brilliant at formation flying. So are the Red Arrows, by the way, and you, you know, we won't say which one's the best, but they're both brilliant acrobatic, aerobatic teams. But how about 300,000 birds flying in formation? I don't know whether you have much of this over here, but we do in Europe get occasions when whole flocks of birds gather together preparing themselves for migration. And it particularly happens with starlings. When they, we don't understand fully what they're doing, but we do understand that they never bump into each other. And this is about 300,000 birds all gathered together. Watch this with me. Can we have the sound? <laughs> these birds in coordinated flights. And it's just a wonder to see. These are things which show to us the marvel of God's hand 
on every single creature. Wherever you look, friends, doesn't matter what you do, maybe you enjoy other things in nature. Maybe you love plants. Maybe you're a great lover of some other aspect of creation. I'll tell you another time, not now, but I'll tell you another time about the bombardier beetle, which I've studied for years. And even that little beetle gives glory to God and gave me an inspiration for a spray system. I tell you, friends, God has demonstrated that he is by what he has made. When it comes to the end, God won't say necessarily to an atheist, oh, you didn't believe my book. He may do, it's up to him. He is the king of kings. But he may well say to an evolutionist who has been a biologist, why didn't you do your biology with a proper recognition of all the telltale signals which were telling you, Romans 1.20, the invisible things of God are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. And it goes on to say, so that they are without what? Excuse. Look, we, don't, we need to love people who don't yet understand the things of God, but those who refuse to believe, I think we need to press them to see that you are running in the face of the evidence. I sought to say that to my opponent last night, but of course, he doesn't want to know. People are refusing to retain God in their thinking. God said in his wonderful speech to Job, 38, 39, 40. Does the hawk fly by your wisdom and stretch your wings towards the south? Then he said to Job in chapter 40, have you an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like him? Deck yourself now with majesty and excellency and array yourself with glory and beauty. I tell you, friends, everything is telling us that God is and that God is glorious. And in all that he does, he does brilliantly and marvelously. And I love this point. He made the flying creatures before the land creatures. God perhaps anticipated this idea of evolution from land creatures. He says, I'll make the flying creatures first. And that's exactly what he did. So wherever you look, friends, it's brilliant engineering by brilliant engineer. And without him was not anything made that was made. John chapter 1, verse 3. May God be praised. Back over to Pastor Broderson. All right. Thank you, Andy. It's fantastic. Is that great or what? Yes. Thank you. Glory to him, not to me. Yeah. So you're, so you're going to be out back with... Uh, I'll be at the back with the books, and if people are interested, I've got other books that I've written which are available, and DVDs. If you want to pick them up, you can have a look afterwards. Yeah, that, that, it's so great. You know, my only problem with all this stuff is I can just never get it stuck in my brain. You know, it's amazing. I hear it. It's so fascinating. Then I go to tell somebody, oh, what? a bird. It's just a bird is amazing. That's, that's about as far as my argument goes. <laughs> but thank God for men like thank you Dr. Andy Christ. McIntosh. Thank you, Andy, for coming. Thank you for being with us. All right. Well, let's stand together. And, um, you know, the thing, though, to me that is always encouraging from these kinds of lectures is to just see how precise God is in, you know, his, his creative abilities and so forth. And to think that of, out of all of the amazing creatures there are in, in the world, that we are the one that his eye is upon. Because we are the ones that are made in his image. And so, like Jesus said, if God so clothes the grass of the field, or if God takes care of the sparrow, how much more, O oh, you of little faith? So let these things encourage you, you know, that if God instills in that hummingbird, 
you know, all, all of, the, you know, those components for it to be able to do what it does or those uh, plovers to, you know, be hatched and grow and then fly those 3,000 miles, then, of course, he's taking care of all that. What did Jesus say? He's going to take care of you, oh, you of little faith. So.